right, so um, last time I, I gave some general introduction to PEPs, and um, actually I focused kind of on this property of injectivity, which um, implies things such as uh, uniqueness of the ground state, um, and it tells us kind of how physical symmetries are realized on the entanglement degrees of freedom. Today I would kind of like to leave this um, region of injective PEPs. I would like to talk about topological order in PEPs. So the motivation would be that, say, if we want to um, do a fully variational calculation of a system where we suspect, say, it has a certain type of topological order, um, how should we kind of treat this tensor, how, which structure should we give to, to, a, to a PEPS tensor in order to be able to obtain a topologically ordered system? Um, I will explain, say a few words about what topological order is, but if you know that concept, then you already know that it relates to the degeneracy of ground states. So we already know that injective tensors, which are kind of the generic tensors, don't have the right structure because they are unique ground states. So something should be special about these things, and um, ideally we should encode the structure into the tensors. Also, if we actually try to write down some explicit variational wave functions, some explicit ansatz for a specific problem, we might be interested in trying to encode a certain topological order into it, and maybe putting some parameter in our wave function and see how the system changes. We might want to understand the structure in order to know, say, how we can encode the different topological ground space sectors, starting from some variationally obtained tensor, or how we can start to model excitations, the topological nature of the excitations. And we will see that all these things kind of come out in a very natural fashion. So once we understand the structure, we can, for instance, once we know one ground state, create the other ground state center in an easy way. Okay, so, so maybe very briefly, um, so most of you know these things. So what is topological order? And I will be very brief there. Well, different formulation of topological order. Frank also talked about it a bit. Um, so topological order is kind of the type of order which is not Landau order. So conventional order is basically based on the fact that there is a local symmetry in the system and there is some order parameter. So the essence kind of of Landau symmetry is a local order parameter, which measures as well if a system has a certain symmetry or it breaks it. So if you think of the classical, um, well, uh, classical, yeah, whatever. If you think of the Ising model, say with transverse field, 1D quantum Ising model, um, it has a Z2 symmetry, right, if the interactions are in Z direction. So if the temperature is low, the system will align in parallel in the z direction, either all spins up or all spins down. If the transverse field in x direction is large, right, so we're looking at a model. Right, so there's a symmetry. If you flip all spins, um, we will have the same Hamiltonian, right spin flip is x, it commutes with that guy, it commutes with c times c. Um, and we can, we can ask kind of, does the ground state of the system preserve that symmetry or not? If it preserves, like the cartoon picture would be for h very large, the ground state would be a product of eigenstates of, in, in x direction, right? So if we measure something which measures, the, if, if, it, if we measure some operator which anti-commutes with z and uh, with x, so, say, the average magnetization would be some order parameter. And in this case, its expectation value would be zero, right? And on the other hand, if we're in the <coughs> regime with a small field, we would have the all spin up state or the all spin down state, or some superposition as ground states. And a typical ground state, especially these two guys here, will have a non-zero order parameter. They will not have the symmetry, which automatically tells us there must be two of them, right, in that case. Because whenever I take one of them, I apply the symmetry, I will get another one, unless it has that symmetry. So it's kind of all, we, we can really explain what's going on, starting from this fact that there's a local way of labeling the different ground states. That's what the order parameter. And of course, based on that, we can build a whole theory of second-order phase transitions, etc. Um, 
So topological order is different um, in the sense that, well, in particular, that there is some order, but there is no order parameter for it. So what we would have is some system which say lives on a 2D lattice of spins. We have some local Hamiltonian uh, governing the, the physics of the system. And now we put the system, say, on a torus. And what we observe if we solve this Hamiltonian is that it has a degenerate ground space. So if we know Landau theory, we will say, OK, this should mean that there should be a local order parameter, which will distinguish these different ground states, right? which will tell us which of the ground states we have, if you wish. However, for these type of systems, so for topologically ordered systems, so we have a general ground state, but there is no local order parameter. So ground states are locally indistinguishable. Now, on the other hand, what we also observe if we take the same Hamiltonian and say we put it on a different surface, we might try to wrap it on a sphere. Of course, we have to kind of deviate from a square lattice, but say if it's a, some kind of nice regular Hamiltonian, there should be a way to put it on a different type of lattice. What we find in that case is that the degeneracy suddenly might be one, it might be non degenerate. So, what we observe for these systems is that the degeneracy depends on the, on the topology and the genus of the surface. So it depends on how many inequivalent non-contractible loops we can put on the system. Like here we have two, here we have none. We might put it on a surface which has like two holes, then we can put more of these closed loops. This will affect the number of ground states. Now, you can already see that the fact that, that we have this dependency immediately tells us that there cannot be a local order parameter, which labels the different ground states, right? Because a local order parameter indeed would not care about what kind of global topological structure the surface has, right? It would only care about local properties. So we see this is indeed closely related. So an important feature of these systems is that they have unconventional excitation. In a normal system, you create excitations by kind of flipping single spins, by acting in a region. These are localized excitations. They're only, well, they're there where they are, right? Now, for these topological systems, they have exotic excitations, which are so-called anions. And these excitations, well, they cannot be created individually. They come in pairs or in groups. Which, for instance, mean that they're indeed robust against kind of any local perturbation, right? And these, these excitations have the interesting property that if you try to move them around each other, they might behave non-trivially. So for instance, you might take a spin system, which is, well, basically a bosonic system. Nevertheless, it might have excitations which behave like fermions, which you wouldn't expect in a purely bosonic theory, right? Um, they might even exhibit much more exotic statistics. They might exhibit statistics with arbitrary phases, or even not only with phases, but with matrices associated with them. And that's one reason why people are interested in these models, right? Because these excitations could give rise, say, to ways of performing quantum computations by using the fact that by moving them around each other, there is some even non-abelian action, some matrix action on some effective subspace. And because this information is, is encoded in the way we move them around each other, it's not encoded in single particles. It's kind of encoded in the global wave function. So it should be robust against local noise. There is actually a, it's, it's not entirely obvious, but there is a close relation between the excitations and the degeneracy. Because actually what happens is that if we have a system which has these excitations which come in pairs, we can start on the torus to create such a pair of excitations. 
and move one of the excitations once around the torus, move it back, and annihilate these excitations again. And this will actually be a way to transform from one of these ground states to the other. So it's kind of telling you why the degeneracy has to do with the topology, with the fact that you can, there's kind of a history of this state, which is the fact that you once, at some point in time, created this pair and moved it in a circle. Anyway, so what I would like to talk about is how can we describe such kind of systems in tensor network states. And I will start by giving an example of a topologically ordered state and then, well, first of all, try to motivate why this example is a topologically ordered state. And then from there derive a tensor network representation and use this as a starting point for understanding the general structure of these states. So the example is kind of the, the simplest and most well-known example, probably many of you have seen this already, the so-called Tommy code model. And the idea is that we start from a square lattice and we associate a spin one-half system, a qubit, to each edge of the lattice. So we have spin sitting on each edge. And what we do is that we say that if that spin is in the zero state, we will just leave the edge white. And if the spin is in the one state, we will mark the edge with a line. So now each quantum state corresponds to a pattern of marked edges. And now what we would like to focus on is configurations where we only have closed loops. So the letter should go on and there should be some consistent way. Well, Let's do it like that. This actually works with periodic boundaries because the loop which leaves on the top comes back at the bottom, right? So we sum over all loop patterns and take a coherent superposition of these states. And that's kind of a wave function ansatz. Of course, what you want is a Hamiltonian in the end for that. So how would such a Hamiltonian look like, which has a superposition of all loop patterns as its ground state? So such a Hamiltonian would be a sum of, well, on the one hand it has terms which act on, vert which act on the four spins around a vertex. So on these four guys here. And what should such a Hamiltonian do? Well, it should make sure that we only have closed loops, right? So it should make sure that the number of ones and number of marked lines is even. So it is allowed to have intersecting loops, right? So I could have a second loop here. But, but, um, so how, how would that term look like? Well, it should be of the form minus z tensor 4 for these four guys here. Because this exactly measures a parity, right? It measures how many of them are one, how many are marked. And if it's even, the z operator will have eigenvalue plus one, so I put a minus, so it's energetically favorable. So this Hamiltonian in its ground space will ensure that I have only closed loops. And then I want a second term, which makes sure that I have an equal weight superposition of all these loops, right? So what do I do for that? Well, I take Hamiltonian terms which act on plaquettes and which do the following for each plaquette. They take whatever state they find, they flip it and ask that the superposition of these two configurations should be a ground state. So what we put here is minus x tensor 4. If you think about what this guy does, the plus one eigenstates are exactly any configuration plus a flipped configuration. That's what x does, right? So eigenstates of this guy will be of the form, say, nothing plus a loop. Or, well, one line 
plus a deformed line, and so on. So, so what it will enforce is that locally you get a superposition which, between loop patterns which can be transformed into each other by flipping all the spins around one plaquette. And if you think about it, you can convince yourself that this way you can indeed take any initial loop pattern and transform it into any other one, almost, because that's what you want, right? You want that this Hamiltonian enforces that you have, as a, if you have a ground state, you have a superposition of all possible loop patterns. And you can basically connect any loop pattern to any other one by doing single flips around plaquettes, with one exception. So what's the exception? So the exception is the following. If on a torus you have a configuration where you have one loop which goes around the torus, or you have a configuration with no loop around the torus, or two loops around the torus. These two configurations you cannot transform into each other by flipping single plaquettes. Right? So this is really a configuration which looks like that. Because what you can, of course, do is you can flip this plaquette, then you get a loop here. You flip the plaquette above, then you remove this line again, you get a line like that. Now you have periodic boundaries. You flip this plaquette here, which goes across the boundaries. You remove these two guys here, and you get lines like that. So you see you can create two loops which go around the torus. It's not that you cannot create loops winding around the torus, but you can only create them in pairs, right? And if you think about it, that's indeed the only thing which you cannot kind of guarantee or which you cannot enforce by putting local Hamiltonian terms. So what this model will indeed have, it will have four ground states. which are labeled by the number modulo 2 of loops going around the torus. So you have this model which has all these loop patterns here. And then what you do is you say, okay, how many loops go around the torus? So you count like that and you see, okay, it's one, two, three. If, if you count kind of across this cut, you, you miscount, by, but you miscount by a multiple of two, which is fine, right? So this one, for instance, has an odd number of loops. So you see what you get in total, you can have even or odd number around, well, this cut or around this cut. So you get four ground states in total. Yes? If the root has a wind, some finite winding number, for example, winding number Mm -hmm. we can uh, transform to another winding number by applying a local operator. No, indeed, you can change these winding numbers by, by anything which is a multiple of two, right? Um, that, that's why the only preserved quantity is not the, num the winding number, but the, the, the parity of the winding number, um, right? It's also the only thing which you can meaningfully define somehow in a reasonable way by saying you take some kind of cut here and you measure along this cut, right? You ask how many loops do I cut if I measure along the yellow line? Which is a physical measurement, right? And you see that it doesn't really matter how you put this line because, of course, there is this loop here, but it will change it by two. So we see this model indeed has different ground states, and they're only distinguished by some kind of global feature. There's no local way. By looking locally at the wave function, you won't be able to tell if something is winding around the torus, right? Because say, if you look here, what can you say? You see a piece of a loop, but you have no idea if this loop is going to wind around the torus or not. So you have to look globally in the sense that you have to measure at least along one loop, like along this yellow line, which winds around the whole torus, which is topologically not true. So you can also see that this model has some excitations which should come in pairs. So one excitation would be to put an open string. So we do the same. We take our wave function, which is a sum over loop patterns. 
And then we say, OK, somewhere we have an open string. And then again, loops, right? And this is clearly an excitation, because at this vertex, the vertex Hamilton will be extremely unhappy with the fact that there's an open loop, right? So this will be energetically unfavorable. It will be an excitation, but it will only be visible at this point and at this point, right? All in between this line is good, but it has to come in pairs, right? I can't have an open string which only has one end. And there is some kind of dual excitation to that, which is basically saying that when I flip a plaquette, the phase will be not plus but minus. And this kind of also comes in pairs because I can kind of imagine a line, and whenever something crosses this line, I kind of misalign this phase. It's not so important. Anyway, that's kind of the simplest uh, topological model. We can define more general models of this kind by associating some group elements of some finite group here and playing a similar game. But I will mostly stick to this model for the talk. But most of these ideas can actually be generalized. Okay, questions? Okay, so um, now let's turn to tensor networks. So how can we get a tensor network or PEPS representation of this kind of wave function? So what we have is that when we have a superposition over loop patterns, so let's take some piece of such a loop pattern. And let's now slightly rewrite our lattice. So the spins are sitting on these edges. Now let's decorate our lattice by kind of splitting every other vertex. spins, and the spins really only sit where they used to sit. So these new, these new edges I introduced are kind of uh, purely for, well, kind of technical purposes of the construction I'm going to do. So we still have loop patterns which live on this kind of lattice here, right? So they go like that. And now what I do is I will cut this into unit cells of this size here. So I will define a 45 degree rotated lattice and say that this is one unit cell of my lattice and I will try to define a tensor for this unit cell, for the four spins, right? For these four spins here living in this unit cell. So how will I do that? Well, what's, what's happening in this unit cell? Well, this unit cell has these four ingoing lines, and there's a string running on these lines, right? And on the inside, I have these four physical spins. And whenever I fix some boundary conditions, say I take this guy here, there's no string here, no string here, which I denote by a zero state. So it will be a two-dimensional bond. And these guys are denoted by a one state, which means there is a string in going. And now I have to basically choose all allowed ways of completing the string on the inside. So one possibility is to put the string like that. The other possibility one is to put the string like that. And I can keep going on like that, right? So for each boundary condition here, I can write down all consistent string patterns. There are always two consistent string patterns, right? I fix one or I flip it. And of course, I must make sure, right? So I go on like that. So what I get is a tensor which for all boundary conditions, 
which are kind of the virtual indices, I assign all allowed string patterns. So I have these four auxiliary indices, which are exactly this alpha, beta, gamma, delta. I have this two to the four dimensional space sitting here. And for each such boundary condition, there is a proposition of two classical configurations, which I assign here. And all other tensor entries are zero. So what you see is I basically just decomposed this by writing this as a sum over all ways in which these strings could run through these links. So you see, if you, if, if you, if you build a tensor network from that, you will really get an equal weight superposition over all loop patterns, right? Because exactly all allowed loop patterns in this decorated picture have an amplitude one, and the rest have amplitude zero. So now, now there's, there's one thing I, I said for all boundary conditions, which is kind of correct, but uh, there is a subtlety, in the sense that because I have closed loops, I know that I cannot put an odd number of ones on the boundary, right? Because each one means that there's a string, and I'm only looking at the ground state wave function, which consists of closed strings. So whenever a string is entering here, it must be leaving at one of the other three indices. Or there might be two strings even. So, of course, this is fine, right? Because whenever I have a, an inconsistent boundary condition with a single one, there is no allowed string pattern. So indeed, I will not assign a one to any tensor entity. But the point is that there is really a constraint which is telling me that only boundary conditions or boundary states, boundary configurations, with an even parity are allowed. So now, now I, 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 that's kind of the essential property. That's a conjecture that this, I mean, this constraint arises from the fact that we have closed loop patterns. The fact that we have closed loop patterns is exactly what kind of, that the idea relates to the topological order, right? Because that exactly relates to the fact that we have these global loops, which we cannot distinguish. So this fact should be what, what is kind of related or important for the topological order. And well, that's what I will try to convince you in the next hour or so. So we can write it as an equation, this parity constraint. Namely, it's saying if we have some tensor, and we multiply it with a, with a sigma z, with something which counts a parity, on all four legs, then this tensor should be invariant, right? This is exactly telling us that the tensor must live in the even parity set. Right? Because this z on each even parity state will act trivially, while on the odd parity state it will give a minus. If we have this with a plus, it means that the tensor must be supported. Right? It's equivalent to saying that A is supported on the even parity subspace. on the virtual system, right? No um, yes. I missed a point. Um, uh, what, what is this uh, sticking, I mean, uh, this physical index-like uh, thing uh, sticking out from the tensor? Ah, OK. Um, so so we, ha we have this, this picture of this loop pattern, right? Mm -hmm. And we kind of cut it into pieces. Mm -hmm. And now I'm trying to define a tensor, which um, let me try to see if I get a 3D picture. So that's kind of my tensor. That's exactly this yellow box, OK? Uh -huh. Now, the idea is that this yellow box should have four spins, right. physical spins, right? Okay. 
which exactly corresponds to what's in that picture, this square of the original lattice of the model, uh -huh. this, this part. And there are virtual indices going out here. So there are four virtual indices and four physical indices, which are hand-block, of course. Mm -hmm. And the idea would be that, well, I want to discover a loop pattern, so I want to have a tensor which is one on configurations which are like this. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean? It means that this physical spin is in a one state, this is in a one state, this is in a zero state, this is in a zero state. Mm -hmm. And in the virtual system, I use the same language. I mean, this is in a one state, this is in a one state, this is zero, this is zero. Mm -hmm. So that's just a configuration now, right? That's a tensor element, if you wish. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying that this tensor element, A of this configuration, should be 1. Oh. Right? It's something like, I don't know, A, so 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, or something like that. So this one is uh, just the four indices bundled together. I mean, this physical Exactly. Physical. The, the effective physical index is four indices bundled together. Uh -huh. If you want, you can actually get rid of 1 because you know that there's always a constraint uh -huh. in the ground space because you always have the superposition of something in a flipped configuration. Mm -hmm. But it's easier to think of actually four bundled indices. Mm -hmm. okay. An alternative way of getting the tensor network would also be just to assign physical indices to the bonds, which are then just there, there, assigned there, 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 there are different ways. There are different ways of doing it. Another way is indeed to say that you have your square lattice, and you cut it into tensors like that. Then, in principle, you have to assign two physical indices to each link. Or one. It's not the same tensor, right? You have a different one, but still... I, I, I agree it's, it's one way of getting it, but it, it will not be the same tensor. So if you want to make certain statements, it will be different, right? It would be a tensor state expressing the same state. Yes. Well, if, if you double the indices, of course, you have made a transformation on your system. Mm -hmm which will have some effect, right? You will have excitations you didn't have before. Right. Um, of course, what you can do is you can say you, 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 you take your uh, Tommy code lattice, you have one spin here, one spin here, and you cut it in a unit cell like that. Right. But, but there will be some difference, right? It will not be the same tensor. No, the tensor is different, but... Because the physical space is smaller, right? Mm -hmm. No, indeed, it, it will have the same symmetry, that's true. Regardless of how you do it, you should have the same symmetry. If you do it like that, um, well, so there's some advantage of doing it the other way. Well, a big advantage of doing it that way is that it has a generalized version of injectivity. Let me see. I'm kind of there. Get there. <coughs> so indeed, what, what, what one thing which which you see here is that um, if you have a tensor, any tensor, not only this one, any tensor satisfying this equation, it cannot have this injectivity property. Because it's only supported on the even parity subspace. And injectivity meant that I can apply some map here, which gives me access to the full virtual space. But this cannot work, right? Because this thing is only supported on the even parity subspace. I can never get access to anything outside the even parity subspace. Um, the other thing is that in this specific case, if I build it like that, I can indeed get access to the full even parity subspace. There is a one-to-one -one mapping because you can just infer what the outside loop configuration is from the inside loop configuration, if you wish. This is not the case if you make it like that, right? So this is kind of what this is saying. If, if you have this property that it's injective up to that symmetry, it means that there is no extra symmetry you're missing in some sense. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, here we know that by deblocking we can kind of get rid of that. But for formal proofs, I mean, maybe I can say it already. So this has a symmetry, but there's this notion of G injectivity. I will not really talk much about that. And this allows one to generalize a lot of the proofs which one has for, uh, for injective tensors, like that the ground space has a control structure and so on. Well, this, th this smells, of course, a bit like the typical corner problem, which by kind of recutting your tensor, it can probably work. Okay, so kind of the conjecture is that this is a relevant structure which is related to topological order, independent of whether this is actually the Tori code tensor or some other tensor with such a symmetry where Z can be any representation of C2. So kind of conjecture. This is what is relevant 
topological order. And well, this is what I would like to convince you of, that indeed one can understand the whole topological structure of the ground space and also use it for numerical purposes based on such a symmetry. But maybe before I get there, let me, let me briefly motivate a different way how you could get such a symmetry. Because what I did now is I took an actual topological model and I said, okay, if we want to build a topological model, what will happen? Uh, we have the symmetry. So let's try to maybe study systems with that symmetry because we want to know topological order. But maybe you're interested in building variational wave functions for specific physical systems which have a specific structure. And structure means they have a certain symmetry maybe, right? They're transform in a certain way. Things which are governed by the interaction structure. And this is clearly nothing which has something to do with the physical symmetry. You know, the physical system is not involved here. It's telling you something about how the entanglement in this tensor behaves, but not how it transforms physically. So you might think this is completely contrived because, you know, you just make it up basically because you want topological order. So I would like to give a short argument why symmetries of this kind can appear very naturally, actually, if you want to study systems with a physical symmetry. So, so let's say what we want is we want to describe a system which has a physical SU2 symmetry. So we have a spin one half system. So we want to describe some wave function which, well, at least the way it's built up from tensors is SU2 invariant. And how can we do that? Well, we could do it in the way we saw yesterday, where we have an SU2 action U, which is like the elementary how fundamental representation of SU2 here. And now what we want is that this tensor transforms in a way given by that symmetry. Right? So we have some V of U, V of U dagger, W of U, W of U dagger. And we indeed know if we design a tensor like that, the global wave function will be invariant. Any kind of parent Hamiltonian or whatever we build from that will also be SU2 invariant. So it's certainly one way to obtain SU2 invariance. If it's the only one, well, we don't know if the tensor would be injective, yes. But maybe we want non-injective tensor, so there might be other ways. But that's certainly one way of doing it. So let's say we try to encode our SU2 symmetry like that. Well, what do we have to do? We have to choose a tensor, but before we choose a tensor, we actually have to choose a representation of SU2 here, right? So we could try to choose spin one half here, for instance, for both. Well, what do we have? We have to each of these four spaces, we attach a spin one half representation. So we have one half times one half times one half times one half, a four fold product. And we know that this will give an integer representation, right? One half times one half is zero plus one. You have this twice. This is integer. Now, this is a problem, right? Because the left hand side transforms to the spin one half representation. This we cannot choose, right? Because we want to describe a physical spin one half system. This side transforms to some inter according to some integer representation. There is no solution to this equation, right? It's inconsistent. So what should we do? We could try to assign a different representation. But you see, if it doesn't matter if you put an integer or a half integer here. You have an even product. You always get an integer representation. So there's actually no way to solve this equation. So you might say, OK, it doesn't work. There is no way of getting SU2 that way. But that's not true. You have to think a bit outside the usual box of uh, implementing SU2. So what you have to do is you should combine integer and half integer representations. So for instance, you might attach a spin 0 and a spin 1 half, a direct sum to each of these lengths. Now, if you take the fourfold product, you see immediately that you can get spin 1 halves, right? Like you could, for instance, take 3 times spin 0 and one spin one half. And if you do that, let me put this everywhere. Right, you could take zero, 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 and one half, say. This would be a spin one half subspace. And there are more different ways of doing it, right? I mean, you can work it out, I don't know, eight or so, whatever ways of getting spin one half. So there are indeed many different ways where you can find solutions to this equation, right? All you have to make sure that your tensor 
is supported on the spin one half subspace on the right side. <clears throat> and then everything will transform accordingly and things work out. So message number one, if you want to get a physical SU2 on a unit spin, half integer spin on a unit cell, you need to mix integer and half integer representations. Actually, if you remember the resonating valence bond state I explained yesterday, it had exactly that property, that on the bond I had mixed integer and half integer, and now you know why, there is no way around it, right? If I want a spin one half and a square lattice, I have to mix these representations. This could be the end of the story, but if you actually look what's going on, well, what you have to do to get spin one half is you have to pick an odd number of integer spins and an odd number of half integer spins here, right? That's the only way of getting a half integer spin. Yes. Would this argument relies on the coordination number? Well, it, uh, well, if you have a unit cell on, a, I mean, uh, any lattice is square in the end, you know, if you want to actually, if you make unit cells. But it does indeed depend on the kind of underlying graph or whatever, right? If you have a hexagonal lattice, um, then indeed the, the argument doesn't work. But we also know that a unit cell of a hexagonal lattice has two spins, right? If you actually do a, do a lattice in a mathematical sense, which means kind of square, basically. Can we extend this argument to uh, more rigorous proof that if you have a transition variance, and you have one scale one half, well, it's not that you must have topological order. You have the prerequisites to get the Toricot type order if you do it like that. Um, but, but it could be that for some reason it's not topological. It, it has a flavor of a lipschultz matte theorem, right? Which indeed tells, I mean, the 2D version of lipschultz matte well, the 1D version tells you here has half integer spin in the unit cell. Then there must be a second low-lying state, which is either due to some gapless mode or due to symmetry breaking. And in 2D, I mean, Hastings has a version of lipschultz matte which says the same, but it says it could also be topologically ordered states. But you could also have conventional symmetry breaking, or you could have a, a, a critical system. Ah, okay. And we know these things, like Heisenberg antiferromagnet is critical. Actually, RVB wave function on the square lattice is also critical, right? So, yeah. so the narrow state is also included in this construction? Um, well, with Pepsi, it's a bit tricky. No, you could, of course, explicitly break the symmetry, and then you can always do this. <coughs> um, if, you, if you want to, to choose a translation that tensor, it's tricky. We have no idea if you can spontaneously break uh, continuous symmetries in Pepsi. That's an open question. Well, by breaking translation symmetry, it's easy to be uh, dimerized. Indeed. Yes, with Indeed. Pips, but, uh, mm -hmm. Well, well, I mean, the, the point is, I mean, what you would see in Pepsi in such cases, of course, is that you don't actually get a symmetry broken state, you get a long range ordered state, mm -hmm. because the overall wave function is invariant, which, which is fine. And then indeed, if you would add a small perturbation to your Pepsi, you can actually prove that, um, that you get symmetry breaking. It's just that for co continuous symmetries, we don't know if that's possible. Yeah. It could be that there's some kind of Mervyn Wagner theorem, which tells you that you cannot get spontaneous uh, breaking of SU2 in such an ansatz. But we don't know if it's actually true. Right? So it's based on the intuition that there's some relation between partition functions of 2D systems, classical 2D systems, and, uh, and perhaps. Okay, so I didn't really want to talk about SU2 systems, although that's extremely interesting. Um, the point I wanted to make is if you do this, you have to, well, first of all, mix integer and half integer representations. But then also on the right hand side, you have to pick an odd number. Of half integer representations. Right? I have to pick the three zeros and one one half, or one zero and three one halves, to have any chance of getting a spin one half space. So, what does it mean? It means I can define an operator which measures the, whether my spin is integer or half integer. It's like e to the 2 pi i s z or something like that, right? So this would be the operator on the spin zero space. It would be minus one on the spin one, space, uh, one half space. In this specific case, and then what you see is that I get a tensor which must live in the odd parity space. So it must transform odd under multiplication with z. So it's almost the same equation I have up there, up to the fact that I have a minus sign. But if you don't care about translation invariance, you can just block two sides. And once you block two of these sides, you will get the same symmetry but without the minus sign. So in the end, you get exactly the same type of structure that way. So 
maybe it's telling you two things. First of all, these pure entanglement symmetries, like here, can actually arise in a very natural way if you impose physical symmetries. They basically arise from the kind of classification of representations of SU2 into integer and half-integer sectors. Um, the second thing it's telling you is that for SU2 systems, indeed, if they're topologically ordered, it's probably very natural to expect toric code type order, because that's exactly the symmetry we have for the toric code type order. Also, of course, there might be entirely different ways to encode such a symmetry, which are not based on a factorized local representation, but on a more intricate local representation. And this might indeed give rise to different topological order. But that's something we don't really know. Okay, so what I would like to focus on is really what happens if we study tensors with just such a symmetry, what kind of behavior, what kind of order can we expect? So if at this level, and, and I would give you two tensors, one being like a double semion order, the other one being the toric code order, would you be able to tell them apart? Mm, yes. I mean, in general, you are, but just from the symmetry arguments, not yet. How do you give me, you give me a tensor, you say it's SU2 and double semion? No, no, in, forget about SU2 now. Just ah, no, no, the double semion symmetry is very different. But you also have the Z2. Yeah, 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 but it's not like that. I mean, uh, that's indeed not the case. Let, let me maybe explain a bit, and then I will briefly sketch how one can generalize this. Uh -huh. um, double semion is not, not at all like this. It has a Z4 symmetry, in fact. But that's because the double semi model can be understood as a condensed version of a Z4 model. Both of them can. Both of them can, indeed. So you can both incorporate them, you can incorporate both of them into an object which has a symmetry where mm -hmm. this Z is a representation of Z4, not of Z2. Mm -hmm. But let, let, let me maybe continue a bit, and we get to a point where I can kind of rephrase this symmetry condition in more general terms, and then I can maybe briefly comment how the double semion would look like. Okay. Once I say pulling through, remind me of that in case mm -hmm. I forget it. Okay. So the idea would be to study this kind of symmetry, or so I will restrict to Z two really. But we can basically play the same game, and I will make some comments occasionally. with a more general version where we put some kind of finite loop action here. We don't have to restrict to finite groups, but once we go to uh, continuous groups, uh, we can make much less rigorous statements, to the best of my knowledge. Well, most statements I will actually kind of derive work for any kind of group, but of course, what I want, at some point I want to say this is a complete picture, and these kind of statements require more control over the group. Okay, maybe the first kind of clear observation that such, such, such a symmetry is stable, So if I take two of these guys which have such a symmetry, so I won't assume Z is a Pauli matrix anymore, right? All I want is that Z squares to the identity pretty much. Like in the case of this uh, SU2 thing, right? It uh, was not a Pauli matrix, it was one minus one minus one. Then once I take two of these guys together and I make a block, this will again be equal Because the thing with the parity operator around it, because these two z's in the middle, right, I just replace each tensor by the right hand side, there are two z's in the middle, but they will cancel out. So I have the same, so it means that this fact that I'm supported on the even parity subspace is stable under concatenations under growing regions, which is very useful, which also is kind of a prerequisite for having some kind of global order, right? This property should be globally stable, it shouldn't go away as I look at more and more sites. You also see that this property is then not robust against perturbations. That you make an epsilon perturbation here, you have an epsilon weight of being in the odd parity subspace, 
if you block two guys, you suddenly have a two epsilon uh, uh, chance of being in the alternative subspace, right? Because you get an epsilon from the left side and one from the right side. So this is not stable against perturbing the tensors in an arbitrary way. But there is no reason to assume that perturbing tensors in an arbitrary way is a corresponds to a physical process. I, I will say a bit about that later. OK, so now there's an important um, property, which is basically a way of rephrasing this property here, which is this pulling through condition I just mentioned, which in some sense is saying that what we can do, we can rewrite this in many different ways. For instance, we can take two of the z's and put it on the left. Or we could take one z and put it on the left, and all kind of rotated versions thereof. And what's the idea? Well, the idea is that we would like to think of these z's as being aligned along some line. And we want to argue that such a line of z's can be moved through our tensor. Or we have a line like that, and we can move it like that. This condition tells us that if we have a short loop of these, we can remove this loop. So this is something we call a pulling through condition. So, so, so what's the relevance of this condition? Well, the relevance is that it tells us that if we have our Pep's wave function, we can place a string of these z's on the lattice. And this tells us that we can start deforming the string of z's, right? Say, by using this equation there, we can take this guy here and deform it like that, and so on. So by using these equations, you can convince yourself if you have some string of these z's sitting on your lattice, it's basically freely floating around your lattice, right? You can just place it anywhere. It describes exactly the same wave function. It's some kind of symmetry in, in your description of the wave function. It also tells you that if you have any loop of such z's, if you have any loop of z's sitting anywhere on these links, this loop can be removed, right? So <coughs> loops can be moved. Strings can be moved, and loops can be removed. And that's kind of the, the elementary property of, uh, of this z that allows to form strings, which can be deformed, which can be removed if they, if they form closed loops. And we will, I will explain in a moment that this is exactly what allows us to parameterize ground states, to parameterize excitations of these systems in a way which is indeed independent of things like the correlation length of your system in a, in a kind of completely local way due to the fact that we describe everything on the entanglement degrees of freedom and not on the physical degrees of freedom. So, so the point is that in, uh, regarding the double semion model, so what you can do is, so, so the idea is that you can build strings which you can place on your lattice, which can be moved. So you can, you can try to generalize this. using matrix product operators. So basically what we have is that this red dotted line is just an imagined string where we move something through. We can now say that it's an actual string in the sense of a tensor index, right? So we could actually instead write an equation where we say if we have, we have some extra tensor, so we have a tensor A sitting here, and we have some tens tensor M sitting here, and here maybe it's M and M prime, and then there's an actual extra tensor index going out, <coughs> and we say, okay, 
it's possible. So this is an equation with um, seven indices. And there's an equation telling us that we can instead replace this by this equation. So there's a bit of a flavor of some young Baxter equation, if you wish. Um, and you can see, if you have this equation, you can form exactly the same kind of strings um, <coughs> on, on a lattice and have exactly the same conditions where you can move it through. And then you can ask, if I build matrix, if I just look at these matrix product operators here, they will form some kind of algebraic structure. That's kind of what Frank mentioned at the end of his talk yesterday. Right, that you can, uh, you can take these guys, which are these red guys with these dots, and the white indices here, and you say what happens if I multiply two of them, and you figure out that if you design them well, they will form some algebraic structure, and they might form something which basically forms a representation of Z2, and that's what's happening for the double semion model. Mm -hmm. So the double semion model, you have MPOs, which form a Z2 representation, and of course, what you have for the Tori code, you also have a Z2 representation, just that this index is one dimension in that case. And in that, in the case of the double semion, this is exactly the MPO you get for the CZX model on the boundary, it's same MPO. Right, so it's classified by some third cohomology, which indeed relates to the fact that the double semion model is like a, a Tori code model with a twist, which is given by the second co uh, third cohomology cross cycle. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, so the tensors transform very differently in that sense. So it's still Z2, but it just doesn't transform under the symmetry. Exactly. It does have a Z2 symmetry, but it's a more involved symmetry. Yeah, okay. Yes. So, sorry, I'm a bit confused. So, so, uh, so you introduce the string, uh, simple string that the MPO or X string, but um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm a bit confused about so you have already a ground state which is represented by these peps mm -hmm. without string. Yes. And then you apply this string to create the excitation? Well, let, 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 let me get there. I, ha I haven't got there yet. I uh, want to get there, but I thought it's a good point to make this remark about the double semion model. Um, but this, this is kind of only the needed step. I will use this in a second so to explain how to say get different ground states or to get excitations. Okay. Yeah. But this is kind of the step, I mean, that's kind of the general equation, so with young Baxter type. Uh, yeah. So uh, without the MPO, there are two relations over there. So these two are the, uh, identical. Mm -hmm. Then can we define the... It's, it's a bit more subtle here. It's yeah. easier at, uh, on a honeycomb lattice, for instance, right? Because on a honeycomb lattice, um, that's kind of an equation with one leg and two legs, so there's only one type of equation for this pulling <coughs> On a square lattice, you have to be a bit careful, but you can actually show that um, if, if you, if you uh, have these equations, you can transform them in a way where they also. But it's, it's not obvious. It's not just multiplying the C, right? You have to understand more about the structure of this matrix product operator. But it's easier to work, actually, on, on, a, on a honeycomb lattice in that case. Right, so, so what are these strings good for? So imagine we have some tensor in D, which is some ground state of some topological Hamiltonian, say, or maybe topological Hamiltonian, which we wrote down analytically, and it's a parent Hamiltonian, or we did numerics and found that ground state variationally. Um, so what can we do now? So we have a system on a torus. <coughs> kind of only physical x, but they are always there. And what we can do now is we can put this string of z's along a line, which goes around the torus. Right? So I put a string of z's all the way around the torus. Then what will this be? This will again be a ground state, right? And why will it be a ground state? Well, certainly if I take a parent Hamiltonian, right? parent Hamiltonian, make sure that my state looks like this. Right? It's built locally from the right tensor. So any parent Hamiltonian here will, of course, be completely happy because there is no string. It's actually built from the right tensors. However, also any parent Hamiltonian here will also be entirely happy because there is a string, but I know I can move it. So the tensor network actually looks completely fine locally, right? because I could have put the string anywhere else. 
So I see that this indeed describes a zero energy ground, so really a ground state, exact ground state of the parathermal problem. If I don't have parent Hamiltonians, I should make some assumptions about exponential clustering, but if I have a gap phase, this will be true. So if the system is big, the string is far, far, far enough away, it will not give any signature to that state <coughs> locally either. So what this allows me is to, in total, construct four ground states from one tensor, right, which I have obtained in some way, which kind of describes my model, the local structure of my model. But I can still construct all global inequivalent ground states that way. And the point is that if I have this G injectivity, which basically meant that this is the only symmetry, then these four ground states are indeed different ground states, and they're all ground states for the parent Hamiltonian. So they're linearly independent. For a finite system, for infinite systems, one has to be careful. It's not really clear what the statement means for infinite system, all ground states, and uh, linearly independent. But if we get there at the end, I might actually explain a bit what happens if we take a subdynamic limit, how kind of unexpected or uh, well, things which don't really fit into what I just say now uh, can happen. But for a finite system, we really get this topological degeneracy. You see, it's kind of related to the genus. If we try to wrap such a tensor network on some different genus surface by adding some extra tensors, we can build more or less or different types of loops. If you go to general groups, you can do the same game. You can put one group element, a different group element. But then there's some extra constraints. Because for instance, if you have a non-abelian group and these strings cross, you cannot move both, you can move each string individually. But if they're non-abelian, you cannot move the crossing point, right? Because they don't commute. So you should restrict commuting uh, the group elements. And they're not all linearly independent, because actually conjugation with the symmetry doesn't change it. So if you're interested, you can ask me later. Sorry, I still have the intuition Sorry. about this okay. injectivity. So you mean uh, if um, G injectivity does not hold, then uh, they, these ground states can be... There could be more ground states, right? For oh, what is ground states? Let, let me give you an example. One example, uh, uh, maybe the linear independence holds without G injectivity, I have to think. Uh, but to give an example, imagine you have a model which is derived from a Z4 symmetry, like a quantum double for Z4. Then obviously this model will then this model will have exactly this kind of symmetry, but with a representation of Z4 here, right? So obviously you can also just ignore kind of part of the Z4 symmetry and you say, oh, it's a Z2 <laughs> symmetry. And then you will find the four ground states that way. But you know this model should have 16 ground states. So that's why um, you, you, you need that you I mean, that's kind of an obvious way in which you can miss a symmetry, right? You start from a bigger symmetry group and you just look at a subsymmetry. There could be less obvious ways. It's just that, you know, if you want to prove, prove statements, you need a way of kind of saying something like that. A different way of phrasing G-injective, if you remember, injective was kind of saying that the state can be related by an invertible map to a product state, just consisting of intended pairs. G-injective means that it's related by an invertible map to the corresponding quantum double. So G is a symmetry group, right? So to the corresponding quantum double model of uh, the group G. So for Z2, for instance, it would be the, uh, the toric code. So one way of doing these proofs would be to say, I know the solution for the toric code. It has four ground states that can go back and forth, like I explained last time. But there are more, more low-level proof techniques which give you kind of smaller Hamiltonians and things like that, which don't make use of the fact that it relates to the toric but they're kind of much more work to actually apply. Okay. This is true strictly only for the fixed point wave function. What is point? true? Sorry, which part? Well, that you have the simple sigma z that flips spin? No. Like, do we know the opposite? So say, say that we just introduce a field, like a transverse field, which introduces a finite correlation link to the set. Mm -hmm. Do you still know exactly how to get all four ground states on the yes. 
they, they will not be linear, they will not be orthogonal anymore, potentially, right? They will get some kind of slow, well, actually, if you make the system big, they will stay orthogonal. In the finite volume, they will kind of slowly lose orthogonality. Mm -hmm. If you deform your tensor a lot, there might be a phase transition at some point, where it right. actually does not discover the well, logical wave function. Small perturbation, then you say that but but for, for finite systems, I mean, they will lose orthogonality, in principle. Yes. But as you make your system bigger, they will get more and more orthogonal, which is kind of the behavior you want. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this is, I mean, one, one indeed, one, one big virtue of this description, so to say, is that even if you have a finite correlation length, you have a strictly local description of the ground states, and as we will see also of the, 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 the topological part of the excitation. Um, so you don't need to kind of widen mm -hmm. things, right? If you actually want to physically create an excitation or map ground states, mm -hmm. you, you kind of straight operator, which maps between ground states or which creates excitations, gets kind of widened, and it's kind of dressed with the correlation mm -hmm. length. So it has this kind of uh, Gaussian uh, envelope, right? So it's not strictly local anymore. Right. And this stays completely localized. On the virtual indices. On the virtual indices. That's kind of the virtue of describing on the virtual indices. It stays strictly localized. Um, of course, the physical operation, if you actually want to know what is a physical operation I have to do to map between ground states, that just stays as complicated as it used to be. I mean, it's the same operation, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're just interested in parameterizing your ground state manifold, you probably don't care how you map between the ground state. You just want to parameterize it. Okay, but the operation still remains just sigma x or something like mm -hmm. that. The operation is just the symmetry. Uh -huh. I mean, if you lose fully variation, you have to enforce the symmetry anyway for the variational calculation, right? Mm -hmm. Because you will never get it perfectly. You know, that's that's pretty clear. But the basic reason is that if you optimize the energy, you will never get a topologically ordered system, right? Right. Because as soon as you don't produce one one excitation, it will not be topological. Maybe if you say that you don't worry about <coughs> losing slight orthogonality, like if you say that, like if what well, you're losing orthogonality of the states on a, for any finite system, yes, this is the five to five. Exactly. Yes. If you wish, yes, and it indeed relates to the correlation length, right? Because kind of overlaps between different sectors on small tori will be non-zero, right? I mean, these labels, of course, exactly correspond to the to the particle labels. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to do a Fourier transformation, but anyway, there's a mapping of this to the particle labels. Mm -hmm. And then if you put it on a finite system, of course, you get interference kind of around. Well, I think I agree that you get the topological path right, but the, they would not be perfectly orthogonal. They would not be perfectly orthogonal, and you don't expect it indeed. And if you, if you look at the overlaps, they indeed co correspond to correlation functions between like, right. like pairs of annuals, annuals like the mass gap. That would really create an orthogonal set of states that would be well, again, so in the thermodynamic limit, there are also, so, so okay. you get what you want in that sense. And in the finite system, it doesn't even make sense to talk about topological order, if you're perfectly honest. No, mm. no, no, it's, no, I, I, it's, 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 it's very subtle, right? It's, uh, it doesn't really work in the finite system. So no, I, 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 I don't really agree. Can I ask a question? Sure. So you mentioned about quantum double. Mm -hmm. So um, I wonder, for instance, how the uh, uh, other models, like double um, okay. icing model, Ah, yeah, like Stringnet models? Right, those being implemented here. Well, the Stringnet models fit into this picture. So what I'm kind of focusing on is, 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 is a picture which are doubles of groups, which are this type of symmetry. Uh, the more general picture is indeed using these MPOs. And there are many similar ideas, and it gets algebraically much, much more complicated. I mean, even if you go to non-abelian groups, it doesn't it already gets right, quite tricky. Right, right, right. That's kind of, I kind of wanted to present the main ideas. That's why I try to stick to Z2 mostly. Yeah. Uh, since you're saying that if I generalize this product, uh, symmetry operations to MPOs, then exactly. I'll be able to count. You can get all stringed models, and the MPO is in fact exactly described by the F symbols. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I can explain you later, maybe, I'm not sure it's of general interest, but it's okay. it's actually very straightforward to see this whole equation if I write it with F symbols. You will immediately, uh, it's just a pentagon equation, in fact. If, ah, okay. if, if, you do it, if you do it on a honeycomb lattice, if you have a honeycomb lattice, you have a tensor like that, no? And you have this guy equals this guy. And you see here you have three tensors, and here you have two tensors. And each tensor is an F symbol. So it's like two Fs and three Fs. And there's yeah, a, yeah. If, if you work it out, there's one sum. So you exactly get pentagonal equations. All right. Yes. OK, so we indeed already discussed that you can parameterize a ground state manifold. You can parameterize things like minimally entangled states to compute S matrices and T matrices, uh, which I. Well, let me just briefly say how you would do it. But the idea is, of course, that if you want minimally entangled states, so you have your ground state, you cut like a piece out of it on the torus, and you know you could have a string like this, 
or a string like that. And what you want to get minimal entanglement is that on the boundary, rather than putting something like Z tensor N along a loop, you want to project onto parity sector. So you want to put one tensor N plus or minus Z tensor N. Because this will kind of minimize the entanglement because you only have a fixed parity for all the auxiliary indices here sticking out of the boundary. So this will give you minimally entangled states. So if you would try to compute the SNT matrices for these models, that's the kind of states you would look at. Or overlaps and things like that. But let me maybe uh, try to explain how to get excitations in this picture. There are two ways to model in excitations, and both are, I'm, I'm usually changing my mind all the time, which is a, a more convincing one. But, uh, so what are, what are excitations generally in a, in a PEPs or in MPS? I mean, how, how would you model excitations, say, numerically? And well, what answer, certainly if you have a non-topologically ordered system, would be to take your original <laughs> tensor network and to take out one tensor and replace it by a different tensor, which is some B, right? Whereas the rest are all A's. So A is a ground state. You put a B at one point. It's again, in some sense, of course, the fact that in a PEPs or an MPS, you can describe an excitation with a correlation like strictly locally, because the other tensors will pass on these correlations, basically. So if I put, that would be the usual kind of excitation, and that's for an MPS or also a PEPs. I could build momentum eigen states or something like that. So this is certainly a localized excitation, right? If you take a parent Hamiltonian specifically, parent Hamiltonians will only see this excitation locally, right? Any parent Hamiltonian acting here will not see the excitation. Other Hamiltonians will see a bit, but if there's a finite correlation length, they will only see for a certain range. So this is certainly what would be a local excitation. Now, local just means that it can only be seen locally, right? It's not a delocalized big object. But it doesn't mean it's topologically trivial, necessarily. So what would be the right way of asking, is something a topologically trivial excitation? And topologically trivial, one way of defining it, means you can create it locally. And that's kind of the definition I would like to use. So a topologically trivial excitation is something which can be created locally. So what, th what this means is that I take my tensor network and I can act with some local operation L, a linear map, which will indeed take this guy and transform it into that guy. So it means that if I take a single tensor and I apply L, this should give me B. Now, this is not a unitary, right? It's fine if it has some finite success probability. I'm saying, you know, you do something, and if with 10% chance you can create a thing locally, it's certainly not topological. So what you also see is if you have this injectivity condition, any such B can be created from an A. Because what we had is that we, if we have this linear map corresponding to the A, there exists the left inverse. And then I can, once I have a left inverse, I have access to these degrees of freedom here. So I can just put a B there instead, right? So if this is my map L, the left inverse, and then putting B, I can get any B I want. So injective indeed cannot have non-trivial excitations in this, uh, in this framework. Now, what happens here? We're not in the injective case, right? So it might happen that there are excitations of this kind which are not trivial. And this is indeed the case, right? So if we have this G symmetry, or G injectivity, well, any symmetry under such a group action. What this told us is that this tensor is supported on the subspace with even parity on the entanglement degrees of freedom. Now, obviously, if it's supported on this even parity subspace, well, I can, if it's injective on that subspace, do whatever I want on that subspace. But I would have no chance whatsoever to get a tensor on in place of this tensor, which is not supported in the even parity subspace, right? Because I just have, I mean, I don't have, by acting here, I don't have any access to the odd parity subspace, right? It's just not there, I cannot see it. So the odd parity subspace cannot be accessed. 
So if I have a B tensor, which transforms with a minus sign under Z, then I can never get this tensor by acting with a linear map here. Because if I act with a linear map here, on the left and on the right, I get a new tensor which satisfies exactly the same equation. If I can just multiply both sides of the equation with L on the physical index, it satisfies the same equation. It transforms even under Z. This transforms odd. There is no way to get there, right? So this transition cannot be done. This looks like a tensor point. <laughs> um, so then the point is that these guys here form topologically non-trivial excitations. Right? So now what I can do to simplify this, because this is kind of, well, it has lots of parameters. So it's a tensor which is just transforming in a specific way. I can simplify this slightly by saying, OK, I'm not really interested in the exact cancer here, because I might have to optimize it variationally anyway to find a two excitation. But I want to pin it to be a topologically non-trivial excitation, because say I want to compute a dispersion or some property <coughs> of some topologically non-trivial excitation. So ideally, I would like to split this guy into a part which is trivial, which is what I can kind of create, modify locally, and a part which is non-trivial. And what is non-trivial? Well, it's, it's this minus sign, right? It's the way in which it transforms under the symmetry. So what I can, for instance, do, I can define an excitation tensor P, which is just the original A, multiplied by a sigma x. Because now if I multiply this guy with sigma x, you see that this, this A is the original tensor. Right? It transforms even. You, you see that this guy here has this x here, will exactly get a minus sign. Because what I have to do is I have to take this z, I have to commute it through x, which gives me a minus sign, then it goes away. So indeed, it transforms odd rather than even. On the other hand, any other b I can basically obtain by acting here. Right? So everything else, except for putting this x here, is topologically trivial. So the way to basically capture an excitation, which is topologically non-trivial, is to put some x on a link. And then additionally, indeed, around this x, I should optimize one of the two tensors around it if I actually want the lowest lying excitation. But to just capture the topological nature, what's important is to put an object on a link which transforms odd under parity, or in a general group case, which transforms like a non-trivial event of my, of my symmetry action. So one thing you can see, this kind of excitation cannot be created locally. That was exactly the point, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's in the odd parity subspace. What you can see is if I also have a second object somewhere else, I can create them jointly, right? Because if I act kind of on any region which contains both of them, the total tensor in the joint region has even parity, because it has two odd parity objects. So then by acting with any some kind of string operator, I can indeed, at least potentially, linearly, right, maybe not unitarily, create a pair of those. It looks a bit like monopoles, right? But the point is, of course, if you put this on a torus, you cannot put an odd number of these guys in the system, right? They're not really connected by a string, like you might imagine with anions, but still, they, they have a global constraint. Because if I put this thing on a torus, the total thing must transform trivially. So, I must, so the number of x's must be even, right? I must be the trivial uh, irrep sector total. And again, if you would do a variation calculation, you would take this as an ansatz. And in addition, you would start to optimize some tensor around it. Right? Or you would indeed optimize a tensor in the odd sector. But I'm really more interested in the topological part, so I will just omit the fact that you can dress this tensor and just look at this x. So that's what's usually known as electric excitations. Sorry, maybe let's confuse. If, if you just apply 
X operator mm -hmm. to that one, don't you create excitations on the two adjacent tensors? Mm. No, the tensors are perfect. I mean, the no, no the, I, mean, I mean, if you have any kind of Hamiltonian, which only looks at this tensor here, it will, it will, not, it will not be bothered, no? Because this X is, uh, is not part of, of, say you have a parent Hamiltonian which acts on, uh, on this region, no? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the parent Hamiltonian checks that the tensor network looks like it's built from the right tensors, and it looks like it's built from the right tensors. Right? So, so, so it means that on this, on this kind of site, which is indeed already a blocked object, the Hamiltonian will not see anything. So the only Hamiltonians which see something are Hamiltonians which act on these two spins jointly. I think you're just very confused with this other way of writing down the tensors. There it would just put both of them into the odd sector. Say again, which other way? Well, if I just think of having the tensor, and now it's flipping basically, exchanging occupied with, em uh, occupied with empty, mm -hmm. then this would just affect both tensors on the left and uh, the Well, I mean, here you can absorb it either here or here, no? But, um, Excitation should, should sit on links. I mean, if, if you think the way we, we originally derived this for the Tory code model was to, to take basically a block, it used to be yellow, right? We had a block which um, corresponded to one plaquette of our tensor network, mm -hmm. and then the next tensor was another plaquette. <coughs> so if I'm saying the excitation sits on a link here, it actually means that the excitation sits on this vertex. Mm, yeah, I think this is the confusion because the different ways of expressing the Tory code. Yeah. Exactly. And, and the other type of excitation we will see in a second sits on plaquettes, which basically means it either sits on, well, here, which is indeed a plaquette, mm -hmm. or it sits here, which is, well, this plaquette plus some dressing of the tensor itself. I mean, of course, if you block, you have to be careful. But this derivation is, is really not so much dependent on the G injectivity, unless you want to prove that these are the only excitations you can build. Mm -hmm. So even if you do numerics, you might want to avoid block, you try to avoid blocking because it breaks translation symmetry if you want to resolve k dependence or things like that. Um, should it not matter on which of the four legs you put the x? It should, oh, it does. It does matter. It does. Yeah, in this case it does. Yes. Why would you want it to matter? Wouldn't you like a formulation which is just in an odds parity subspace rather than the even one? Yeah, yeah, but it's excitation. It must be localized somewhere, no? Yeah, Indeed, if, if you want it to be kind of localized around the side, you can put the x here, 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 here. But in, in, in principle, yes. the excitation is localized between two sides. That's, that's the right way of thinking about it. The point is you always know that by blocking, you can, you can localize on a single side. And it's now one of the two possibilities. For example, for the Tory code, this would be just one. Oh, there are different excitations. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, yeah, this is electric, right? Oh, ah, OK. So get a like. So let me. Uh, no, if you put it on another link, it doesn't, mean, doesn't just mean that you are uh, frustrating another cross in the code. If I do what, sorry? So instead of putting on the horizontal link, the X, you put it on the vertical links, it just means that you frustrate the other cross. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, but it's an excitation on a different position. Right? So a different position, I see the same kind of excitation. Yeah, I'm not saying it's different. No, no maybe you don't understand. No, but indeed, this is only half of the excitations of the model, right? So let, let me just briefly explain the other half. This was kind of explained by saying I have this local symmetry of the tensor, and I look at tensors which violate the symmetry, but they're local objects still. Right? So the local excitations, in the sense of I replace one tensor, but in a way which violates this parity constraint. And the second way of building excitation is related to this pulling through condition, to the fact that strings are invisible, right? So the idea there would be I take my lattice. And I put a string of z's, but I let the string end somewhere. And I will claim that the end point should be on plaquettes. So what you see now is that what is the state? Well, we know that the parent Hamiltonian, where it checks for the correctness of the wave function, we know the string can be moved, right? So the Hamiltonian will certainly be entirely happy. The string will be invisible to the Hamiltonian. 
But the same does not hold for the endpoints, right? The endpoints are special. So what's special about this plaquette? Well, what's special about this plaquette is that there's an odd number of z's adjacent to this plaquette. And if you check this equation here, you will see that it changes the number of z's by an even number across each plaquette, right? So this plaquette will always have an odd number of z's. I can manage to move this string like that, right? That's perfectly fine. But it will always end on this plaquette. There will always be an odd number of z's around this plaquette. So this means that, in principle, a Hamiltonian should be able to see this. And you can indeed show that it is able to see this. So there will excitations be sitting at the endpoints. And that's the other kind of excitations. Here it's much more evident that they have to come in pairs indeed, right? Because they're actually endpoints of strings. So they, they, they come in pairs for kind of more obvious reasons. The other ones also have to come in pairs, but we really have to say, aha, the global object has to transform trivially. And again, of course, we should allow to dress the endpoint if we're not only interested in the topological nature. But that's exactly the point, right? The topological excitation should be characterized by two things, the topological part, which is kind of global, and something which is a locally trivial excitation, which I kind of can attach to it or detach from it or whatever. So indeed, I should allow to kind of change the tensors close by, or one tensor or whatever. And these are magnetic excitations. Again, if you think about um, non-abelian bookstores, they should be characterized by conjugacy classes, in fact, rather than group elements, uh, which you want to know why as we later. And well, I'm kind of at the end, let, let me just briefly say why we, or how we can understand the non-abelian statistics of these particles. So the great thing, again, is we don't have to care about how we move these excitations. Let's just assume there is a way of moving these excitations. Maybe there's none, then we're in trouble. We have to be careful with that. But if we assume there's any way of moving them, we don't really have to care how we move them. All we need to know is that there is a way of taking this type of excitation, this type of excitation, and transforming it into a system where we have moved it, right? Norbert? Sorry, Norbert? Yeah. No, sorry. Well, is, is there an extra tensor on the plaquette? Or do you just say the shirt ends on the plaquette? But the stop here, no, it's, I just marked the plaquette. There's nothing sitting there. Okay. This was just to indicate that the, the string doesn't end on a link, but on a plaquette. But this is only at the fixed point that there's nothing and then away from the fixed point. No, no, no. no I mean, I, again, the, the excitation consists of two parts, right? And so if I discover an excitation, Topological, I will have the string which goes somewhere. And then I, I should allow to kind of dress this thing locally, so to put a different tensor here. But this different tensor should be a tensor which I can create by kind of acting on the physical index. So it should still be in the even parity sector. Now you could argue I have to change this in a certain region, but we know that by blocking, we can always certainly block it to a single side. And also we know if you have done variational calculations and you achieved a big enough bond dimension, changing a single tensor actually amounts to changing the whole regime. Right? If you do MPS and you do an excitation ansatz, indeed you only have A, you put a single B here, and still this can discover a very big excitation because your bond dimension is so big, so just by counting you know that you have access to a number of degrees of freedom which are logarithmic in the bond dimension, which is still quite a, a relatively large regime. But I mean, probably you have access to more, right? But just by counting, you see the dimension of the space to which you have access to at this dimension. Same is true here, right? But I'm kind of mostly caring about the topological part. This part indeed exists. But this is kind of not the interesting one for understanding kind of what the topological nature is. But indeed, if you do numerics, that's what you want to optimize for. And the topological part, it will just keep fixed. Because that's something which, uh, well, this is not affected. Right? Also, it's a discrete thing you cannot be optimized. So, so once we assume we, that, uh, yeah. okay. so once we assume we can move these excitations, and again it might be it's impossible, but if it's possible, we don't have to think how we do it. Same for the log as for the logical operators, right? We don't really have to think how to do them. Then we can ask what happens if we move these guys around. And for instance, what we can ask is say we have an X type excitation sitting here on the link, and we want to move the Z once around it, right? So we want to kind of do a, a full exchange of these particles which would amount taking the C, moving it once in a circle, and moving it back. So what does this mean? It means we took this guy here, 
we take the C and like for convenience that deforms a string. It's just a string, you know, we can deform it. And then we have moved this guy in a circle. So what we have done is we have taken this guy here and moved it, well, somehow like that. And now we want to compare these two guys, right, for the braiding. We want to know if you acquired a face, say. So what do we have to do? We have to re-express it like that. So for that, we can re rewire these Zs. This looks a bit sloppy here. So what I have is I have this loop of Zs, and I have this loop of Zs here. But of course, there's no meaning to say that there's one loop which goes like that, or there's one loop where the line goes like that and a second loop which kind of is a closed line, right? I mean, this line has, has no, no meaning at all, right? I just multiply these, right? So what I have here, it got a bit messy, but what I had in this plaquette here was that I had four z's, and once I interpreted like this, right? Then I had one loop. The other time I interpreted like that. Then I have detached this string from that, but it's exactly the same thing for me. Now what you certainly see is I can start making this z loop smaller and smaller, and it will commute to the other z's. They're all z's they commute, right? So I can kind of pull this z loop until it only kind of wraps around this x. So what I'm left with, as compared to the original picture, is that I have this x here, and I have a small loop of z's around it. And now I know once I pull this z loop through the x, I will get a minus sign. Right? So I will get a minus sign from this. And then the thing goes away. Right? Then what I have is that I indeed have a, a loop of z's here, a single x, and this loop of z's goes away. So I'm back at the original picture, but I have acquired a minus sign. So you see you indeed have this mutual statistics. And you can generalize this to arbitrary groups, and you will see that exactly they act the way they should. Meaning the irrep part acts as an irrep on the corresponding group element. Yes? So suppose you replace this product by MPO, then you have to worry about the order when the, uh, the string crosses itself, whereby you can implement R matrix, I suppose. Well, the, the crossing of strings even gets, gets tricky for another million groups, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, not with itself, but at least two, if two strings cross. Right, right. Like, indeed, for what you get for non abelian groups is that the pure string-like object, which are group elements, are actually conjugacy classes, they already acquire non trivial grading statistics. For the MPOs, you can't really separate electric and magnetic, right? The yeah, MPOs, right. both things come at once. You have a string and some way of constructing the endpoint. And this is a joint object. Here you can combine them, but you can, first, in the first place, treat them separately, and only later combine them. So the suppose end. I have an MPO that creates the endpoint corresponding to semi -object. Mm -hmm. then if I rotate the thing by uh, 2 pi, then there will be a self-crossing point in this MPO. Mm -hmm. But I suppose you can eliminate it for by uh, switching the order. So basically, depending on how you're uh, moving those strings across the other. Well, you have to check the equations right, for the right, specific right. MPO and see. So I suppose the information about R matrix will be hidden in this MPO as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, indeed. So that's this paper which, which Frank mentioned uh, with... Uh, was the first author, Nick Bunting, I think, um, where they discuss in, in, in great detail, like for these MPOs, how we create excitations and how we can expect the onions. But it's, it's indeed, it's, it's fairly heavy machine that we get there. Okay, I think that's a, a good point to stop. I should maybe point out that um, this all sounds like uh, once you have the symmetry, this is one to one corresponds to topological phases with exactly that kind of order. That's not the case. As we very well know, there are critical models which are SU2 invariant, which have this kind of symmetry and so on. And the point is that I described these things on the auxiliary level, but I never really said whether they actually correspond to physical excitations. What I kind of said is that if they correspond to physical excitations, so if I can move them, etc., they will break the way they should. But it could be that these guys actually don't describe excitations. So for instance, it could be that if I put such a string on my system, it describes an object which is not properly normalizable, which is zero. Or it could be this kind of object which is actually not at all different from the ground state. Now, if I have g-injectivity and a finite system, this will not happen. These objects will be different from the ground state and they are normalizable. But as I make my system larger and larger, it could happen that this object has a norm which goes to zero. 
And then I would argue it's not properly normalizable because a proper normalization of a system would be to normalize each tensor in a way where your system is nicely normalized. And the point is if I normalize a tensor such as the ground state has norm one, it might be that the thing with the string has a vanishing norm as you make your system bigger. And that's something, in that case, one would argue it shouldn't describe a proper excitation. Basically, one would argue it's something which, which became confined. Or if it's indeed no, it gets closer and closer to the ground state as you make your system bigger, it could correspond to a condensed excitation. And these things can happen. So if you describe systems like that, you actually have to check for these things. Which, well, you might say it's a disadvantage because you don't know if you have topological order. I think, first of all, it's not surprising, right? In 2D, you can never really tell from the local structure exactly what physics you have. I mean, not even for StatMac, right? I mean, except for the Ising model, you never really know, given a Hamiltonian, what the system will do. You know what it can do, right? You know it has a Z3 symmetry, you know it can break it. But you actually have to run a, a numerical simulation usually to figure out if it does break it. Same kind of fear, you know, it has a certain symmetry, you know, it can realize a cer certain anion model, but it can also realize a smaller anion model where part of the anions have become condensed, confined. But I think it's also good because it tells you that even if you fix these symmetries, you can still uh, describe a whole uh, family of, of different topological models if you want. Okay, thanks. I mean, in the mirror, all you think are unitary, right? Or isometries, which fixes pretty much if they're invertible, right? And stuff. So, so to me, injectivity is something like, like some invertibility condition, which um, in mirror are kind of hardwired what's invertible and what's not. But I'm not entirely sure if I understand the question correctly. So you're saying injectivity means that if I have access to information to physical indices, I'll be able to fully access information for the virtual. Exactly. Well, it tells you there's a one to one correspondence. In the so you're saying Vera is very hard to see how. Well, I'm, say, I'm saying it's, uh, uh, it's always or never in some sense, right? Because the, the way in which the physical layer is related to the next layer is yes, have unitary, which indeed gives you full access. And then you have isometries, which indeed always remove information. But this way, you always have access because it's an is isometry. So in principle, there you have access to all levels, right? Just by construction, because all maps are kind of unitary or isometry, so they have a well defined notion of invertibility. So, in that sense, I would say it's maybe always injective. I'm not sure if it's. Uh, I mean, you have to specify what you mean a bit more. Like in, in a PEPS, it's very natural. If I give you a block in the physical system, you can like cut links around that block, yeah? The virtual links. In, in a mirror, you need to tell me if I have a, a local set of, a local block, like it's connected. By uh, many layers, mm -hmm. you, you have to tell me which surface you want to cut along. Right. And I think they're like, due to the isometric tensors, there will be at least one surface that is injective. Uh -huh. But maybe I the agree. wrong surface, if you choose it, is not. Mm -hmm. Quite surface dependent. But it, it feels kind of very injective because it's. But an MPS can be written as a unitary circuit, right? I mean, an MPS doesn't have to be. You can, you can, in a, in a circuit gauge, you No, 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 no. If you want a unitary circuit on a finite system with open boundary conditions, it will be, I think, effectively injective, no. Depends what you call injective. Well, the individual tensors, no, but. Uh, I mean, it would be a different injectivity. Yeah, that's right? different, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I kind of agree, yes. But uh, that's a very different argument, no? Because the unitary is not from the physical to the virtual system, it's from one virtual and the one virtual system to the physical and the next virtual. Right? In an MPS, you have an MPS tensor, MPS runs like that. It's a unitary form here to here. So it's a, a unitary form virtual into physical and more virtual. In the mirror, it's, it's kind of the opposite. No, it's a, it's a unitary form, the higher level virtual indices to the lower level ones. Isn't the, isn't the, the error of 
Anyway. Yeah. You can just put all of them. Anyway, I think the real question is what do you want to do with injectivity, right? Uh, so you should define the concept according to what you want to, to use it for, like for instance, proving what like normal forms or uh, uniqueness of ground sets and so on. And then you can ask such a question from Mira, but it might be that the concept you would need for that is entirely different. <coughs> uh, so that might be a very naive question, but you briefly mentioned that topological order doesn't really make sense in the case of a finite system. So why is that? I think no kind of order makes, like no kind of phase transition makes sense in a finite system. No. Topological order is even a bit more subtle because of course I can't say is a symmetry broken. If I, I can't write down symmetry broken states in finite systems. Topological order depends what you mean by it, but if you mean the fact that you have non-trivial non braiding, then non-trivial braiding only makes sense if you can braid on all length scales somehow, right? You can put a million anions and you will still have non-trivial braiding. Otherwise, the point would be that on a certain length scale, you can always have non-trivial braiding, even in a trivial phase. Yeah. But, so kind of if you keep your things close, apart, close by, I think you can get non-abelian phases, but if you separate them more, it might be that suddenly they behave completely nice in abelian. Then it's not topologically ordered, right? So, so it really has to work on all length scales. It's a global property, right? So as soon as you have a, a length scale cutoff because you're a finite system, it doesn't really make sense to say something happens on all length scales. And for fixed point wave functions, yes, but I mean, as soon as you go away from a fixed point, it's... Uh, I'm a little confused so about that. Uh, I mean, if you think about the Stein electoral code model, I mean, even if you consider a finite mm -hmm. system, if you define that uh, on the torus, then I mean, uh, for, for, for the degeneracy, is exact, right? No, I, I, I agree. It depends how you define topological order, right? Indeed, if you define what the ground state degeneracy, it works for fixed point wave functions. Once you're away from it, you have you have to say how do my ground state split because you want it to split in a way which vanishes in the, topolo in the thermodynamic limit, right? Mm -hmm. And then you already need the thermodynamic limit. For fixed point wave functions, I think you can argue that it works. Mm -hmm. Away from it, I think you have to be super careful. I mean, let, let's say you want to compute a topological entropy, you know? so you compute entropies for different regions, mm -hmm. which means you have to make a fit. But if you only have a finite system set, you actually cannot make a fit. And you could, I mean, it's perfectly conceivable on any length scale to have a system where your topological entropy goes, or your entropy goes like that, or the region volume, right? Goes like that, and then at some length scale, it will kind of uh, do this. And you can set up systems where this happens on any length scale, I'm pretty sure. But that's, that's why you have to check in principle. Of course, it will not happen in realistic systems, right? But in principle, it's a length scale question, right? It could be on a certain length scale, it still looks topological. And I think if you just cause a phase transition, this will probably happen for topological models, right? That, uh, on a certain scale, it's, it's might, it might get very hard to decide how to fit this function because it changes its behavior on certain scales. Mm -hmm. There is no way to tell whether it will eventually happen or not. No, no, I, I, I agree, I agree. Uh, so but you would expect that this relates to the correlation length in the system. So if you have a short range correlated system, you, system, you will not expect that in long length case funny things happen. But, so if you study, for example, half cylinders, this doesn't happen, right? Independently on the finite size of your cylinder. Right? So if you scale with the transverse size of the cylinder, you will always see the topological entropy. No, in indeed, indeed. but that's, that, that's because it's not never really topologically ordered on cylinders. No. You always have to do scaling, right? But, but what I mean, the essence is that, that, that everything is analytic in finite systems, so it doesn't make really sense to talk about phase transitions, for instance. So, right? really, let me reflect. So, if you, if you study the entropy of a half of an infinite cylinder as a function of the transverse side of the cylinder, uh -huh. you will always see topological entropy if you're in the correct ground state. Say again, if you. Sorry. So, um, no matter how small or big your cylinder is, if you study the entropy, of half of a cylinder in the correct ground state, mm -hmm. and you do the scale, you will always see the correct, you will not, never see that jump that you talked about. Yeah, and it would, because you, 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 you'd need to get a, 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 a net state, and if your correlation length is of the order of the your, the, the your cylinder, then you're not going to get okay. a... Let, let, let me give you an example. It's not a ground state, state but... Uh, some let me give you an example. You take a toric code. And then you do, okay, let's, uh, so you take a topic code, wave function, any wave function, it's, it's open boundaries, right? And then you dope it with some, like, some particles, with some epsilon density of, say, electric particles, okay? 
then if you do, say, any braiding experiment, your computer topological entropy, anything will look fine if your length is kind of smaller or length squared is smaller than other epsilon, right? Because what happens if you do some braiding or whatever, if you have an E particle inside, like it's fluctuating, right? It could be anywhere. If, if you go around the E or you don't go around the E, it will completely screw up your braiding statistics. It will also completely screw up your topological order, right? Because if you have an E particle, which is entangled with a different one, that is like a propagating wave or so, it will, it will add an, a topological entropy of one. So as soon as you have a high probability of having one of these particles or more of these particles in a region, the system will look non-topological. And indeed, globally, this is not topological if you do it with excitations, right? Mm -hmm. However, if you look in small enough regions, which means any region where you have a good chance of not seeing a single ele uh, electric particle with, with, with which you doped, it will look exactly like the ground state. Right? So it will be topological up to a certain scale, which is 1 over epsilon, or if you want to work square epsilon, and then it will not be topological. And this will happen in any variational calculation because you optimize energy density. Right? You will always have a fi in any variational calculation, doesn't have anything to do with PEPs or MPS. In any variational method, you will always have a finite density of excitations, in principle. Kind of enforcing the symmetry indeed avoids that you have these excitations in some sense. Right? So if you enforce the symmetry by hand in a variational calculation, you indeed rule out to have these excitations. So you force the system to kind of, uh, if it breaks topological order, at least not to break them this way, but by condensation. Um, so it, it, it can always happen, right? For two ground states, I, I'm, indeed, that might be different. But uh, if, if you get variation wave functions, you can never be sure that they're topological. Well, you can actually sure that they're never topological on a, on a very large scale if you optimize for energy density. But of course, we know we can still extract this information because we know how accurate our energy is, etc. There is no further question. Yes. That's the lecture. Yeah.